So now we're going to talk about sampling from a population. So before we do that, we need to know the difference between a population and a sample. So a population is everything that's of interest to you. All the people in the United States, all the episodes of Bob Ross's television program, all the cells in the human body, something like that. And then a sample is a subset of the population, which we could collect data on. So a sample of Americans, a sample of cells, a sample of Bob Ross TV episodes. And we're going to have uh, a picture that we're going to see over and over again. I usually call this my favorite picture, uh, and you're going to get very accustomed to seeing it. So it has this big oval, uh, which we will call the population. And I'm going to put some dots on here to represent people or episodes or cells or whatever they are. And then I'm going to draw a smaller oval, and that's going to be my sample. And so the sample is going to get drawn randomly from the population. Let's see, pick a few of these semi-randomly. So we could pull out some members of the population to make a smaller sample, which will have fewer observations. Um, and so the process from going from the population to the sample, that's called sampling. And then what we want to be doing in statistics is this sort of movement back in the other direction, which is called inference. I might have said this before, but inference is drawing conclusions about the population based only on information from the sample. So that's going to be one of our big tasks in statistics is to make inference, draw a conclusion about the whole big population just based on information we have from the sample. And there's lots of stuff to know about sampling, that process of drawing some observations out of the population. There's this common example uh, given of Dewey defeats Truman. So um, that photograph is a photograph of Truman the morning that he was elected as president, and he's holding a newspaper that has the headline of Dewey defeats Truman. So uh, you probably don't remember the name Dewey, but you probably know that Truman was a president. So it's not true that Dewey defeated Truman. That, that's not what happened. What actually happened is that Truman won. Um, and the reason for uh, this mis, uh, mistaken headline is that the Chicago Daily Tribune had uh, sampled people in Chicago and asked them, who are you going to vote for? Um, are you going to go vote for Dewey or Truman? And overwhelmingly, people said they were going to vote for Dewey. So what went wrong? Well, it turns out that the only people that they sampled uh, were people with telephones. They called people on the telephone to ask them who they were going to vote for. Um, and at the time, not everyone had a phone. In fact, the people who had phones were the people who tended to have more money. So phones is basically equated to money. Um, and money was also equated to voting for Dewey. And so they undersampled the, uh, the people who were going to vote for Truman uh, by not calling them uh, because they didn't have phones. So this kind of thing can happen in many situations. Um, we've seen some sampling bias uh, in terms of polling with recent presidential elections as well, although I don't think that there's as neat of an explanation as, uh, you know, they were just calling people on telephones and people uh, who had phones had money. So there's many ways that we could end up with sampling bias. Uh, so basically any time that we end up with a sample that is different than the population, so you could imagine, you know, my population, but maybe you just sample, you know, this, this piece of it, and so then you end up with a, uh, a little sample that doesn't really look like a mini version of the population. It looks like a piece of the population, but it's not a random sample. 
Um, if the sample is different from the population in some way, then there's sampling bias. And if there's bias, then we can't make inference. We can't uh, make a conclusion about the whole population because our sample wasn't representative. So the best way to avoid sampling bias is to take a random sample. Uh, statisticians love random samples because they have these nice properties, like the mean of a random sample is centered around the true mean, a non-random sample probably wouldn't have that property. Um, and there are ways to do random sampling uh, that are different. So there's sampling schemes. The one that we're going to focus on in this class is the simple random sample. And that's as if you put everyone's names in a hat and then you drew out uh, their names randomly. That's the simple random sample. There's lots of other sam sampling schemes. So there's stratified sampling where you break people into similar groups and then you sample within those groups, like sample a certain number of first year sophomores, juniors, seniors. There's also cluster sampling where you try and um, sample something that's going to have a heterogeneous population. So maybe we're going to pick a few different buildings on campus and just sample people within that building. Uh, if you have a rare disease, there's this technique called snowball sampling where you get someone, uh, recruit someone to be in your study and you say, do you know anyone else who has that rare disease? And maybe they can go out and recruit more participants. And there's lots more. So I'm just telling you that so that you know that it's not all random sampling, simple random sampling, but that's the one we're going to focus on in this class. Sometimes you can't take a random sample from your population of interest. Maybe it, the population is too large, uh, it would be too expensive, uh, or it's just not possible in some other way. Um, so then you need to think about what population you could sample from and only make inference to that population. So maybe you want to know something about all college students in the United States, but you don't have a way to take a simple random sample of all college students in the United States. States. So maybe you just take a sample uh, from St. Thomas students, but then you can only draw your conclusion to the population of St. Thomas students. You can't draw your conclusion to all college students in the U.S. So um, let's think about some uh, examples here. So let's say that we want to estimate the number of hours um, Americans work each week. My guess is it's around 40 hours, but we don't really know. We'd like to we'd like to study that. Um, so there are a bunch of different ways we could think about sampling. One is we could pick out three gas stations in St. Paul, and we could have a researcher at each one. And then for an hour uh, from 10 to 11 p.m., we have them just survey everyone who comes to the gas station. How many hours do you work per week? Or we could randomly sample phone numbers from the US and call them and say, how many hours do you work per week? Or we could go to Best Buy, which is one of those big companies in Minnesota, and we could say, can you give us some anonymized data, how many hours uh, your employees clock in each week? Um, and I'd like you to think about uh, what some advantages and disadvantages of each of those sampling methods would be. So maybe I'll just talk about some advantages and disadvantages for the first one. So um, if we pick these gas stations in St. Paul and we have people survey uh, people uh, every night uh, from 10 to 11 p.m., um, here's an advantage. It's really doable. Um, I think that I could probably get some researchers to go out and do that. Um, it wouldn't be that hard. Uh, but a disadvantage... It's not a random sample of all Americans. So there's many things that might make those people different from all Americans. One, they're just people in St. Paul. So they're not going to represent people in all of Minnesota or all of the United States. The other one is if we're surveying people late at night, they might be people who work, uh, you know, a later shift. Maybe they're heading to work then and maybe the number of working hours for people who are at the gas station in the late evening, maybe their working hours are different than, than other people. So we might not even be able to make inference to all people in St. Paul. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of advantages and disadvantages. I think numbers two and three also have advantages and disadvantages. We can talk about that during our synchronous class session.
So there's lots of ways that you could have a biased sampling method. Um, it would be bad to sample based on something related to the variable or variables that you're studying. So, you know, if you go and ask people at the grocery store, how many meals do you cook at home each week? You're probably going to catch people who cook more often. Uh, if you use Instagram to recruit people for a study on social media usage, you're probably going to get people who uh, use at least Instagram a, a, a fair amount because they saw the, the recruitment. Um, if you let people volunteer to participate, that can also lead to a bias. So um, if you email people a survey about tech difficulties, uh, not everyone's going to respond. And actually, probably the people who respond are the ones who don't have problems because they're the ones that were able to get the email. Or if you call people during the day um, to ask questions, the people who are going to be around to pick up the phone and, and be willing to answer your questions, they're probably not going to be uh, the same as just like everyone in your population. They might be more likely to be retired, less likely to be employed, um, or uh, things like that, right? Um, and there's lots of other ways that a sample could be biased. So spatial units um, are almost always related to one another. If you know what's going on in Hennepin County, you probably have an idea of what's going on in Anoka County. Same with time periods. If you know what's happening today, it's probably pretty related to what's happening tomorrow. Uh, so anything where the observations are spatial units, where the observations are time periods, those tend to have some relationship between the, uh, the observations. Wording can make a huge difference in survey questions. Uh, I think you could imagine how you could ask the same question two different ways to get two different answers. Um, sometimes you can bias your, uh, your sample by asking people to answer a question from other friends. Maybe there's one way that they would answer if you were in private or they got to write it down, and there's another way that they might answer if they were um, speaking in front of their friends. Lots more ways that that can happen. So the most important thing is that you always need to think critically about potential sources for bias in your data. Um, I've given you a bunch of ideas of ways that your sample could be biased, uh, but there's many more. So you got to use your critical thinking skills.